I remember that my mom used to say that she would fight lions for me. Now, maybe you find that hard to believe, but with my whole heart, I think it was true. True not only figuratively, but literally as well. I also remember with a lot of the camping that I did out west, the repeated warning from the park rangers always said that the most dangerous place to be was standing between a mama bear and her cubs. So this would seem to be true, not only for the four-legged variety, but for the two-legged variety also. Mothers will do anything. They will stop at nothing to provide and to protect their children, willing even to suffer indignity and perhaps even death. Despite all odds and obstacles to the contrary, perhaps even a pride of hungry lions, they will face down every challenge. They will defend against every attack, or they will die trying. I believe this begins at pregnancy. From that moment of conception, when she nourishes that life within her by selflessly and sacrificially offering up her body and her blood. Kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? We are willing to endure a certain amount of suffering in order to obtain the things that I want. But we often find that we quickly reach our limits, that we are seeking some sort of escape or to deaden the pain because what I hope to gain just isn't worth the fight. The scales tip too far in one direction. You see, there is passion, a willingness to suffer, and then there is compassion, that willingness to suffer with or for another. When that other is somebody that we love, or even more, when that other is a child, there is no limit to what we are willing to endure. While mothers may end up fighting lions for their children, would that it be that mothers, and perhaps others, fight with an equal zeal, an equal fervor for themselves? In our gospel today, we hear about just such a scenario. This Canaanite mother is desperately seeking help for her demon-possessed daughter. Because of the ends to which she is willing to go, it is safe to assume that she has reached the end of her rope that she has exhausted all other possibilities, that Jesus is her last and only hope. But even before she begins, before she begins this encounter with Christ, she already has three strikes against her. First of all, she's a woman. And women did not talk to men, especially those men that were not their husbands in public. Second, she was a Canaanite. She was a foreigner. And foreigners did not mingle with Jews at all. Third, she was a widow. And widows had nobody to advocate for them, nor could they advocate for themselves. They were just simply out of luck. So despite having these three strikes against her, she is in such a place of desperation that she decides to swing anyways. Have pity on me, Lord, son of David. Lord? Is he really her Lord? Now, Jesus comes from this line. He's a descendant of this, this group of people that was mortal enemies with the line from which this woman came from. Far from being her Lord, this was her enemy. And yet she stoops. She stoops to give him this exalted and revered title not only by her words, but by her gestures. She humbles him, herself before him to pay him homage. And for her willingness, there is more insult to add to her injury because of what she receives in return. Three things. First, Jesus completely ignores her as if she doesn't even exist. He walks right by without even lifting his glance. The disciples do a little bit better. They at least acknowledge that she's there, but only to the extent that they want to send her away, dismiss her as some kind of pest or some kind of nuisance. But the worst insult of all comes at the end, and it comes from Christ, the very person from whom she was seeking help. 
and he calls her a dog. Now, this isn't some kind of cutesy, euphemistic, diminutive little comment that somebody would make. Maybe today we would be accustomed to that because we are used to treating dogs better than people oftentimes. But in that day, dogs were vile, filthy, dirty creatures. There's no way to understand this other than it was an open-handed slap across her face. This is an insult, and there's no other way to slice it. And yet, she continues on. If it was only for her, she most likely would have lashed out. She would have turned and, and walked away in anger. Who has to put up with this kind of abuse? And it would have been done right there. But she doesn't. Because she wasn't there for herself, she was there for her daughter. And Mama Bear continued on. She suffered and, and endured the injustice and all that indignity of what was said to her. She pushes forward and fights until she obtains that for which she came. But she obtains more than that for which she came. Not only the healing of her daughter, but the healing of herself. She receives great faith. Love is necessary. It drives us to overcome obstacles. But great love is necessary to overcome great obstacles. It is that which, which motivates us, which moves us beyond ourselves, helping us to grow and to face down challenges that in other circumstances we would shrink from or perhaps even slink away from. This is one of the things that tends to uh, fill my reflections or even cause me a little bit of concern. For as a celibate, one who doesn't have a wife or children, I'm concerned that there is no relationship in my life that will stir such a, a fervent and passionate love, a kind of love that would send me into a burning building without a moment's hesitation, a kind of passionate love that would cause me to face down a hungry pride of lions. But that's a concern not only for celibates. It's a concern for others as well, perhaps singled or married, those people who find themselves so often in isolation, islands unto themselves, those people who will not permit their hearts to be open to such a passionate kind of love. And it is that kind of love that leads that woman in the gospel to arrive at such a great, deep, and profound faith. Faith, we could say, is a willingness a willingness to walk out on a limb that we're, we're not sure will sustain our weight. So what is it that has to be at the end of that limb that would drive us, that would motivate us to take such a risk? What is it that's going to move us to such determination, perhaps even to such desperation? Is it our own needs, the needs of another? or perhaps just the needs of a child. Certainly God does not relish in, nor does he desire that anyone should suffer, let alone children. But what he does desire is our salvation and the great faith required for that salvation. He desires it so much. He loves it with such a great passion that he is willing to face down every obstacle to see it come to fruition. Every obstacle, every challenge that we might face, even suffering, even death, even sacrificing the body for the sake of the soul. Now God is, is not desiring. It is not part of his positive will, his His intentional, direct will to allow one to suffer. But it is a part of his permissive will to allow that person to suffer in order to stir, in order to bring forth the courage, the love, the faith of another.